Well, thank you very much. This is, uh, I love this meeting. I really love the meetings where they bring together two fields and that's been my bread and butter is, is uh, engaging in interdisciplinary research throughout my career. And one of my favorite conferences to go to in this line is the Gordon Conference. And if you've been there, uh, you know, it's a drinking game when you see these, <laughs> see the, all my images you drink. But uh, it's, <laughs> it's been an amazing uh, discovery to see these protoplanetary disks and see where the planets are actually forming. And um, astronomers, when these images came out in the 2013-14 time frame, and then a few years later, they realized uh, this is best explained. These gaps in, in the disk are best explained by the formation of planets. They realized planet formation must be very rapid. Uh, and in fact, I think the, uh, the masses in these gaps here are inferred to be kind of close to Jupiter mass. So uh, the astronomers discovered that planet formation is very rapid. And I'm always really amused because everyone else knew that before that. Um, the meteoriticists and the planetary scientists already knew that planet formation was very rapid. Um, going back to, well, not that long ago, but 2011, the dauphin Parmand hafnium tungsten dating of Martian meteorites showed that the, the majority of Mars's mass was accreted in a time frame between about one and three million years after the birth of the solar system. And it, it, it may took, have taken a little while to form, but it was substantially formed by about three million years after uh, CAIs. And so this means that you had planet-sized things that are you know, Mars mass, a tenth of an Earth mass, out there uh, only a few million years into solar system evolution. And, and Mars is at the sort of average of the terrestrial planet forming region. So who knows how, how long it took the other things to form. So planet formation and these planetary embryos was very rapid. Uh, right after that, I started working on um, one model. I've been working on chondral formation for 20 years. And uh, I started working on a model where uh, the, the melting of chondrules is explained by um, melting uh, by passage through solar nebula shocks or nebula, sorry, shocks in the solar nebula due to these planetary embryos on the centric orbits. So I feel like I should explain this is an ordinary chondrite and there's these millimeter size inclusions that are silicate rock and they were each individually melted uh, while floating through the solar nebula, the protoplanetary disk and the temperatures it takes to melt rock are quite high. And so there was some energetic event that melted everything in the asteroid belt, one grain of sand at a time. So that's a major mystery. And uh, I think that it's best explained by having one of these planetary embryos, one of these Mars-sized things, uh, on an eccentric orbit so that it's moving supersonically with respect to the gas and you have a bow shock and particles passing through that bow shock are heated, melted, and go around. And all this chondral formation is happening at about one and a half to three million years after uh, CAIs and the birth of the solar system. And so this, to me, uh, this is the, uh, to me, the most compelling model of how you, how you would form chondrules. And so I, I infer the existence of planetary embryos on eccentric orbits at, at the same sort of time frame. And it's very interesting that um, a, a body on an eccentric orbit like this is constantly moving at supersonic speeds with respect to the gas. This is from a, a paper we did in 2013. These are the different components of the velocity, but this is the total velocity difference between the embryo and the gas as a function of phase in its orbit. And it's always moving at many kilometers a second with respect to the gas. So the supersonic shock waves are possibly a natural outcome once a body is on an eccentric orbit. But it doesn't stand in a centric orbit for very long. This is a calculation of how its eccentricity, basically the maximum velocity, but the eccentricity would uh, damp over time. So over hundreds of thousands of years, uh, most of these bodies go back to being on circular orbits. But nevertheless, they could have been there. And, and the existence of chondrules to me implies that you did have planetary embryos early on, uh, as early as it took Mars to form, and that they probably were on eccentric orbits. But it doesn't stop there. There's a lot of other evidence that you had very large things in the solar system early on. From meteoritic data, we know that the solar system was divided into two isotopic reservoirs. This is sort of a, a sea change in our understanding. Uh, it started about a decade ago, but this paper by Croyer et al. 2017 really emphasized that you had to have a Jupiter-sized object uh, form in less than one million years, at least the core of a Jupiter-sized object, like a 20 to 30 Earth mass object form, so that you could separate the solar nebula into two reservoirs uh, that could each evolve differently isotopically. And picking up on that idea, I uh, developed a model that came out in 2018 where we tried to explain the distribution of um, meteoritic inclusions and CAIs 
And uh, we also infer the existence of a 20 to 30 Earth mass uh, core of Jupiter at about 3 AU by less than 1 million years. And so this is a, a graph of where you are in the solar system and what time it is and all of the different meteorite parent bodies that are forming. So there's a lot of evidence now that you had very big things very early in the solar system history. And um, this uh, is not the end either. There's uh, more work on um, the embryos of the terrestrial planets. And I, th I think this is a really important point to make. For a very long time, uh, most of the people studying how the planets form are kind of going backwards in time. And so you see this big event that formed the Earth and the Moon, uh, this last collision, which took place at about 60 million years after the birth of the solar system. And, and it maybe created a magma ocean. And so we, we tend to look backwards in time and think about that as how long it takes to form a planet. But in fact, we really have to uh, start at the beginning and go forward and realize that you're probably building the planets out of these sort of Mars or larger size embryos and that they take uh, only a few million years to form. It may take tens of millions of years for two of them to collide and merge, but they substantially form. Planet formation is over uh, in, that, in that sense by a few million years. So um, thinking about that and um, using hydrogen as a tracer of these processes, there's a pair of papers I was on uh, one trying to explain D to H ratios in the Earth. And there are these uh, deuterium to hydrogen measurements of deep mantle plumes. And here they are correlated with water content. But these are lavas coming out in Baffin Island, and they sample the core mantle boundary in a sense. And there are some very light hydrogen um, samples, which are lower than most any other planetary materials. And it was inferred that they are sampling uh, solar nebula hydrogen. It's the only reservoir isotopically light enough to, to uh, explain that. And so we developed a model in uh, Wu et al. Um, 2018 that uh, argued that the largest embryo that made up the Earth was large enough and had a magma ocean and was in contact with the protoplanetary disk gas and, and it dissolved hydrogen into it. Uh, and that is the signature of the low D to H material. And, uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, there's these lunar samples that were measured by Katie Robinson here at LPI, and they are extremely low D to H, extremely light. And for sure, this is the only explanation that, uh, that it was dissolved solar nebula hydrogen. Um, they're in the moon, and the moon's magma ocean took place way too late. Uh, there was no more nebula, and it wasn't, um, therefore, the, the low deep age signature must have come from either uh, the proto-Earth or from the impact around the Earth called Thea. And since we know what proto-Earth was doing, we, we think that it must have been in Thea. Uh, so we infer the existence of dissolved solar nebula hydrogen into the magma oceans of the largest embryos that, that made up the Earth. And, and frankly, we infer that uh, Thea itself was a large embryo. So you need to be about 0.4 Earth masses in order for uh, you to have a thick enough hydrogen atmosphere to dissolve the amounts that we're talking about. Uh, we put together a, a consistent model that explains the silicon isotopes, the FeO content, all the other isotope systems, as well as the D to H. And basically, it starts with Thea being about 0.4 Earth masses and hitting up Proto-Earth that's about 0.6 Earth masses, which is actually very consistent with Robin Knupp's most recent models of uh, merger as the mode of giant impact. So the hydrogen is telling us a story, and what it's leading us to is that maybe Earth and Thea were simply two embryos that each formed in the nebula, and it wasn't like dozens of smaller things. So... Um, I made it sound as if all of this planetary science and meteoritics uh, was all figured out ahead of time and the astronomers are, are latecomers, but that's, that's not fair either because, in fact, the whole idea that you could use hydrogen in gas into a magma ocean, that, that's something that was informed by exoplanet studies. And we've known for a while now that a lot of the Kepler exoplanets, especially those larger than 1.6 Earth radii, have hydrogen helium atmospheres. And just as one example with specific numbers, Kepler 11F is about a two Earth mass planet with a substantial hydrogen atmosphere. And the disks that they form in typically retain gas for only about three million years. So this is telling us that you have these several Earth mass things that are forming in, you know, less than uh, a few million years in order that they can hold on to thick hydrogen atmospheres 
and uh, they have to grow large enough before the gas goes away for them to do that. So uh, exoplanets are telling us that you can have hydrogen atmospheres, and they're telling you that planets get very large very fast. And I really like this paper by Lauren Rice et al., um, where they're looking at the uh, rocky exoplanets in the um, multi-planet systems in the California Kepler survey system. And here's a histogram of the radii. This is the sort of boundary that separates those that we think have gas atmospheres from those that don't. But um, the main thing here that I look at is that you have an awful lot of very large super Earths. And uh, so they probably grow very quickly in the disk. And uh, in order to have hydrogen, they must grow very quickly while the disk is, is still gaseous. And then there's a, the additional results that she's found that um, in the multi-planet systems, the planets tend to be similar in size and evenly spaced. And I think the community is still trying to digest what that means or how that could be. But all of this tells me that pebble accretion or something like it is necessary. You need some very fast formation mechanism. And uh, pebble accretion as a model came out in 2012, and it's inspired by both uh, solar system and exoplanet studies. If you read the paper, they're sort of equally inspired by explaining things in the solar system and exoplanets. Uh, it's a recognition that the way a planet accretes solid material depends on the presence of gas in the disk. And if you have gas in the disk, you can accrete things much more efficiently. And so anything that crosses the uh, hill radius of this planet can eventually accrete in. And there's this formula for how the planet would grow that depends on the, the surface density of pebbles and its hill radius, et cetera. Um, it, it turns out this is so efficient, it eats up everything in its annulus, and then it, it has to wait for more pebbles to come in, and, and so the formula has to be modified to look at the radial flux of pebbles, and then you have to multiply by an efficiency factor because you got to ask, do they cross the gap or do they get eaten first? And in the end, you get the same formula. But the formula tells you you can grow by tens of Earth masses in, in millions of years. So that kind of explains it, but not quite, and there's some difficulties with this as well because it's possible also that the pebbles bounce off the atmospheres of the planets. There's a lot of unknowns. It's an active area. One thing that I was inspired to consider, though, is what if these um, planetary embryos that are feeding by pebble accretion are themselves on eccentric orbits? Inspired by the chondral formation models that we were doing, I was wondering how that would work, and it's going to work a lot better. It's going to eat a lot more efficiently because the eccentric orbits allow the embryos to sweep up material at a, a far greater uh, rate, it's sweeping up more area, and doing so at a relative velocity, which is kilometers a second instead of fractions, and so it's doing so at a greater uh, relative velocity. So uh, we tried to estimate how big an effect this would be and derive the, the same formulas. There's a lot of math, there's a math, it's in the abstract, so you can read it there, but the idea is that you have a larger area and you have uh, larger relative velocities and you can work out in different regimes what the feeding rate is. The feeding rate is, is probably this formula and it's proportional to the eccentricity of the planetary embryo. The planetary embryo though, it's damping. It's, it's eccentricity uh, will decrease over time. And so if you scatter, for example, a planetary embryo into an eccentric orbit, it will start to grow very quickly, but the faster it grows, the more massive it is, the faster it will circularize its orbit. And so there's sort of this, this race. But one of the very interesting aspects of this is that when you integrate these equations, you find that pretty much all the planets regardless of what mass you start an embryo at, if you kick it up to an eccentric orbit with this eccentricity, it will grow to this mass. And this is in the supermass range, and it, uh, it's sort of independent of the initial mass. So small planets get kicked, they get to a higher eccentricity, they tend to grow faster, and they catch up. And so we think this might have something to do with the uh, uniform sizes of, of the uh, planets, the super-Earths in the uh, CKS survey. Uh, it's also a lot faster. Uh, by, than um, the traditional pebble accretion models, which assume a body on a circular orbit. So these are some of the connections that we're making. There's a lot of synergies. Solar system studies inform exoplanet studies because uh, growth by pebble accretion when the embryos are in eccentric orbits is something that was inspired by uh, studying chondral formation and looking at what happened in our solar system. And I think planetary embryos might accrete much more quickly and accrete most of their mass while they're in eccentric orbits, and maybe this would explain the Weiss et al. piece in a pod result. But exoplanet studies also inform solar system studies, and uh, the, the very existence of super-Earths and their hydrogen atmospheres 
makes plausible things that weren't considered before in the solar system community that you could ingas hydrogen into magma oceans. Um, and to me, it suggests Proto-Earth and Theo was maybe just two planetary embryos, 0.4 Earth masses, no big deal. We have planets bigger than that in exoplanet systems. And I'll just throw this out there. I think Venus was a single planetary embryo formed in one stage from the disk. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.